Hello everybody. A few videos ago I mentioned that I'm working on a translation project with a brilliant German developer. Andreas is translating and dubbing my videos into eight other languages with the help of AI and the nifty software he wrote himself. Really brilliant stuff. Now we have for the first time a great video from a German source that we want to share with you in an English translation. You're about to see a public lecture by retired General Harald Kujat, who served in the German Air Force and even was the chairman of the NATO Military Committee from 20, uh, 2002 until 2005, so he was a NATO guy. Uh, he has emerged in Germany as another outspoken critic of the way NATO and the Europeans are abusing Ukraine for the geopolitical benefits of the United States. So General Kujat is so outspoken that Wikipedia actually knows that he belongs to the inner circle of Vladimir Putin. <laughs> oh, the propaganda. There are also a lot of Europeans who see behind the, this veil of lies. So many thanks and a shout out to the German portal Nachdenkseiten uh, for broadcasting uh, this event and for the Eurasian Gesellschaft uh, for holding it. Um, links to both of them in the description. Now please have a look at the Germans who see behind the lies. So let's just start, ladies and gentlemen. Considering the very different interests, the propaganda, the disinformation, yes, I would even say the lies that are intertwined in this war, in this Ukraine war, and the entanglements in Ukraine by many states, but also around Ukraine, one sometimes gets the impression that this is an unsolvable Gordian knot. According to tradition, Alexander the Great found the solution to the Gordian knot by using his sword. He cut through the knot that tied the chariot of the Phrygian king Gordios to the yoke of the horses, thereby beginning his conquest of Asia Minor. That is the tradition, according to Plutarch. But there is also another tradition, which goes back to the Roman historian Lucius Flavius Arianus. According to this, Alexander solved the knot through the liveliness of his mind by recognizing the function of the linchpin for the resistance of the knot and simply pulling out the pin. You surely understand why I mention this here. I mention it because Western policy follows the path of the sword. It follows this path because it lacks what distinguished Alexander the Great, the vivacity of the spirit, namely to recognize that the key in the Ukraine war is a negotiated peace. But let's start with a cursory look at the geopolitical situation and then talk a bit more about the Ukraine war. The 21st century is characterized by the rise of China as an economic and military superpower and by the rivalry of the great powers, namely the United States, Russia and China. The Ukraine war has triggered a new dynamic in the relationship of these great powers, also in their rivalry. But it has also created clarity in an important case. Only China and not Russia is capable of replacing the United States as the leading world power. The current American national security strategy confirms my assessment as follows. I quote, The People's Republic of China is the only competitor that both intends to reshape the international order and increasingly possesses the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do so. Beijing has ambitions to create an extended sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific and to become the world's leading power. And that's why, in the Ukraine war, the United States aims to weaken Russia, its second geopolitical rival, politically, economically, and militarily, to such an extent that they can focus on the confrontation with China, their biggest adversary. To achieve their strategic goal, the United States has sought close cooperation with Europe. Especially in the current federal government, they have found not just a willing ally. This chancellor, as his visit on Friday to Washington shows, is apparently also ready to take on a leadership role in the Ukrainian proxy war. However, it should be considered that the European allies, just like in the Ukraine war, are also intended to be involved in a future conflict with China. Together with Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, they are supposed to form an Indo-Pacific network of partners and allies against China. One might think this is a clever move by the United States, to first strike Russia, the weaker of the two geopolitical rivals, and then, 
in a proxy war, of course, not directly, to then turn to China, the stronger opponent. However, like the American strategy expert Harlan Ullman, I believe that the USA is making a big mistake by opening a strategic military two-front confrontation against China and Russia. Harlan Ullman described this as a ticking time bomb. Therefore, the war in Ukraine is a turning point for Europe. It demonstrates the determination to embark on the path to geopolitical self-assertion, politically, economically, technologically, and not least militarily. Much of what has happened in connection with the war in Ukraine over the last two years becomes understandable when one knows that Germany plays a particularly important role on the geopolitical chessboard of the United States, especially in its Russia strategy. For George Friedman, a respected American scientist and geopolitician, it is clear that Russia and Germany together would represent the only power that could threaten the United States. Therefore, he says, America must ensure that this does not happen. The greatest fear of the United States, according to Friedman, is that German capital and German technologies combine with Russian raw materials and Russian production potential. A unique combination that the USA has been greatly afraid of for a century, according to Friedman. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, Russia sought closeness to NATO. The main idea was to achieve close coordination with the alliance regarding the states formerly allied in the Warsaw Pact and the now independent former Soviet republics, especially the Baltic states. What Russia had in mind was to solve crises and conflicts together with NATO, thereby preventing a direct confrontation between NATO and Russia. The NATO-Russia Founding Act of 1997 and the NATO-Russia Council were established as a common basis for this, a period of close political coordination and very close military cooperation was initiated. China is taking a moderate course regarding the Ukraine war. China is convinced that global risks have increased since the war and that Western countries bear the main responsibility for this. This is because they have destroyed the existing international order. China promotes cooperation with Russia. Both want to contribute to the construction of a multipolar world, which, according to Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, will lead to the decline of U.S. hegemony. The Taiwan issue could become the culmination point of American-Chinese geopolitical rivalry. In the so-called Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, the United States committed to providing Taiwan with weapons and other support services necessary for defense. However, the agreement is vague regarding the type of support. So far, all American presidents have left the matter somewhat ambiguous. Das Ganze in einer gewissen Zweideutigkeit gelassen. Oh, ich habe es lauter gemacht. Das geht? Ja, ja. ist ja Wundermann. Ja. Ja. <lacht> diese, diese Ambivalenz, diese strategische Ambivalenz. This ambivalence, this strategic ambivalence was broken by the current American president. He deviated from it. When asked whether American forces would defend the island in the event of a Chinese attack on Taiwan, he answered yes if there actually were an unprecedented attack. Chinese President Xi Jinping repeatedly stated that China is ready to achieve reunification with Taiwan by peaceful means unless there is no other way than the military. I quote him, We insist on pursuing the prospect of peaceful reunification with the utmost sincerity. However, there is no commitment to refrain from violence, and the option to take all necessary measures remains. The complete reunification of the motherland must and can certainly be realized. I am convinced that the United States would neither be willing nor able to defend Taiwan. This is not only due to China's great geostrategic advantages and the enormously growing conventional strength of the Chinese armed forces, including the great superiority in strategic technological areas such as hypersonic weapon systems, but also because China has caught up with the two nuclear superpowers, the USA and Russia, in nuclear strategy. American Admiral Charles Richard, who was then the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, 
and thus responsible for the deployment of American nuclear forces, said about the Ukraine crisis, verbatim, the situation we are currently in is not just heating up. The major crisis is still to come. We will be tested in a way we have not experienced in a long time. When I assess the level of our deterrence against China, then our ship is sinking slowly, but it is sinking. The Ukraine war has promoted the formation of competing geopolitical blocs. While the United States, the European Union, and NATO are moving closer together, a second geopolitical bloc has formed around China and Russia. The core of this bloc consists of the so-called BRICS countries, namely Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, as well as the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. This group includes China, India, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. China is working closely with Saudi Arabia in the global oil market and in the use of nuclear energy, and has also massively supported Saudi Arabia's accession to the BRICS group. Furthermore, China is pushing forward the creation of a commodity-based reserve currency as a competitor to the so-called petrodollar, i.e. the dollar, also with the goal of establishing a worldwide leading currency based on the gold standard. For a worldwide leitwährung on the gold standard, when one knows that the American power... Knowing that American power largely rests on the influence of the dollar, this is a smart way to gain the upper hand in this rivalry. Since the beginning of this year, Saudi Arabia, a formerly very close ally of the United States, as well as Iran, the United Arab Emirates, Argentina, Egypt, and Ethiopia, have been admitted as new members of the BRICS group. That's 3.8 billion people of the world's population who have joined together in a common economic union. 3.8 billion. And I would like to add that currently 40 more states have expressed interest in joining. These include Algeria, Indonesia, Pakistan, Mexico, Nicaragua, Uruguay, Venezuela, and even two NATO countries, namely Greece and Turkey. The fact that the South American states in particular are showing interest is especially painful. The Americans are making great efforts, for example, to prevent Mexico's accession. But due to the developments I have just described, it is all the more important that Europeans strengthen their ability to assert themselves and become an independent actor in international politics. This also includes the ability for conflict prevention and containment. A look at the European periphery already shows how necessary a European security and defense capability is. There, the great powers have been engaged in a struggle over spheres of influence for years. The regional powers are waging a proxy war for regional dominance. Ethnic and religious minorities are fighting for self-determination and independence. Overpopulation, religious differences, and the destruction of natural habitats through major drought disasters provide fertile ground for Islamist and fundamentalist terrorist groups. These disasters occur in a zone that stretches from the Middle East to Africa. The war in Ukraine has led Europe to a crossroads. This war is not only about the security and territorial integrity of Ukraine. It is also about a European security and peace order in which all states of the European continent have their place. Moreover, the dramatic economic consequences of this war for Europe, and especially for Germany, are becoming increasingly apparent. The starting point of a war is always a specific political constellation. I do not want to go into detail about the war in Ukraine this evening, but it is important to understand that a war does not just happen. For example, Putin does not decide one morning at breakfast to invade Ukraine. A war always has a long history and a war leads to a new political constellation. The question, of course, is what this constellation looks like. Should it be permanent? If that is the case, then it must be a solution that is politically agreed upon with both opponents and supporters. Therefore, Clausewitz demands, and no lecture by a former officer is complete without Clausewitz, that politics must prevail in a war and continue despite the hostilities. This leads to a dual approach. On one hand, the necessity of a secured defense capability to defend one's own country, and on the other hand, the effort to achieve a negotiated peace to end the war. 
If politics and diplomacy are suspended, as is the case in this war, then the war, as Clausewitz defines it, is an act of violence without limits. Everyone sets the rules for the other. This creates an interaction that leads to the extreme, what we today call escalation. That is exactly what we have seen from the beginning. The geostrategic position of Russia and the USA, the two main actors in this war, could not be more opposite. Protected by two world oceans, with an ally in the north and a friendly state in the south, the geostrategic factors of space and time play no role for the United States. And they are also not vulnerable with conventional means. The United States is an air and sea power. In contrast, for Russia, because of its large landmass, which is surrounded by many states and crisis regions, space and time are of existential importance. Also, for historical reasons, Russia strives for military security to a special degree. I have the impression that Russia is neither willing to shed its history, nor can it escape its geostrategic situation. The strategic turning point in the relationship between the United States and Russia was the year 2002, namely the unilateral withdrawal from the 1972 ABM Treaty on Strategic Missile Defense Systems, which was enormously important for the nuclear strategic balance between these two superpowers. At the same time, a missile defense system was being built in Europe, which Russia had to understand as a threat to the nuclear strategic balance with the United States. In 2019, the INF Treaty on Nuclear Intermediate Range Missiles, which was so crucial for Europe's security, was also unilaterally terminated. Essentially, the United States thereby gave Russia the opportunity to legally and in accordance with treaties build a new Euro-strategic nuclear threat potential against Europe. One year later, the Treaty on Open Skies was unilaterally terminated. This treaty was very important as it allowed mutual inspections and ensured transparency as well as predictability of military actions. Nevertheless, in 2021, the Agreement on Intercontinental Strategic Weapons Systems, known as the American-Russian Arms Agreement, or the New START Treaty, was mutually extended for five years. There were even negotiations during the Ukraine war until Russia interrupted them due to the massive support of Ukraine by the United States. A security policy turning point was the NATO summit in 2008 in Bucharest, where President Bush tried with great pressure to secure NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine. When this failed, as usual for saving face, a vague membership perspective was included in the communique. The current CIA director, William Burns, then the American ambassador in Moscow, had previously warned the American government. In a telegram, he wrote about the severe strategic consequences. He emphasized that these cannot be overestimated and that they would create fertile ground for a Russian intervention in Crimea and in the east of Ukraine. There is no doubt that Putin will strike back sharply. Today, he is the CIA director. However, the real turning point was the coup d'etat orchestrated by the USA in February 2014 in Kyiv. This triggered the civil war in Donbass and the denial of minority rights to the Russian-speaking population. As you know, this was agreed upon in the Minsk II agreement, which was arranged by Mrs. Merkel and the French president. After that, Ukraine was supposed to carry out a constitutional amendment by the end of 2015, which would grant the Russian minority the same rights as the Ukrainian-speaking citizens. In the United States, quite a few are convinced that the war could have been prevented. This would have been possible if there had been serious discussions about Ukraine's NATO membership and greater autonomy for the Russian-speaking population of Donbass within the Ukrainian state. The war could also have been ended after six weeks. In the Istanbul negotiations at the end of March 2022, Ukraine and Russia reached a mutually acceptable outcome. Essentially, it was agreed that Ukraine would give up NATO membership and adopt a neutral status. In return, Russian troops were to withdraw to their positions before the war, that is, to the status of February 23rd. 
zurückziehen. Dieses Abkommen wurde von der Ukraine auf Druck This agreement was not signed by Ukraine under pressure from the West. At the beginning of the third year of war, in which we now find ourselves, it is obvious that the fate of Ukraine will be decided this year, probably sooner rather than later. The future of the country lies in the hands of the West. Ukraine needs money, military equipment, weapons and ammunition, but above all, it lacks soldiers. We are, literally Zelensky, dependent on financial support. Otherwise, we lose he declared. Almost half of the Ukrainian state budget is financed by the West. Any delay or reduction in the flow of funds could trigger state insolvency. Although Ukraine has significantly contributed to its financial problems through pervasive corruption and continues to do so. As long as the war lasts, Ukraine is dependent on comprehensive military support from the West. But even many years afterward, The reconstruction and economic recovery of the country require a large, long-term commitment, especially from Europeans. The Chancellor has already positioned himself some time ago at the forefront of the states that should enable Ukraine to continue the war as long as it deems necessary, and he has called on European states for greater willingness to perform. And he has European states to greater willingness to perform. The Chancellor has apparently played a significant role in getting all EU countries, including Hungary, to agree to the European financing package. However, this package is to be distributed over 50 billion euros from 2024 to 2027. Compared to the American support package of 60 billion euros, that's not much. It does not cover the financial needs of Ukraine to maintain government functions or the military support needs. However, it gives the impression that Europeans might have to completely replace the USA if they drop out as the main supporter. This could happen if Congress refuses to release more funds, or if support is not only financially but completely discontinued after a change of government. Due to the difficulties in enforcing the current support package, which, by the way, has passed the Senate today, there is some hope from the USA that it will also pass in Congress this week. However, I am not entirely sure as many in the United States are skeptical. Alternative solutions are already being discussed. For example, Japan and South Korea, which do not deliver weapons to war zones, could give weapons to the USA for forwarding to Ukraine. Another option would be for Europeans to pay for American weapons intended for Ukraine. The coordination of support by the United States in the so-called Ramstein format here in Germany is to be taken over by NATO in the future. If you combine these three factors, you will find that the Europeanization of this war has made a significant step forward. However, the USA does not only provide money and weapons. They also make a significant contribution to training Ukrainian soldiers, deliver reconnaissance and target data to the Ukrainian armed forces in a timely manner, and play a decisive role in operational planning. These services, by the way, with a headquarters for Ukraine that was set up in Wiesbaden, are located in Germany. The European states could not provide the services listed, especially the delivery of reconnaissance and target data. The risk that Donald Trump could initiate a radical policy shift after being elected president is high. We know him from his time as president. Therefore, it is understandable that European politicians, who think exclusively in terms of warfare scenarios, are watching Trump's initial successes in the primary campaign with horror. The first Erfolge Trumps in Vorwahlkampf with ziemlich im Entsetzen verfolgen. On the other hand, the willingness to continue the war and to commit financially to it through arms deliveries remains unbroken, or even, as a CDU politician demanded a few days ago, to expand the actions directly to Russia. Previously, he said, we are waging the war because it concerns militia presences in the Donbass, which to my knowledge are not so overwhelming. However, it is a reason. Others, including Germans, whose names are normally not mentioned, have waged wars for similar reasons. It is an illusion to claim that currently no side has a military advantage. I would not describe the current situation as a pact. 
The Ukrainian forces have largely lost the ability to wage an offensive land war after the failed offensive, which was celebrated in Germany and other countries. What they are doing now is evading and demonstrating through attacks on Russian territory that they are still militarily capable. This includes attacks on the civilian population, for example, an event in Belgorod where 25 people were killed, including five children. In October, the Ukrainians attacked the city of Donetsk with American cluster munitions. For example, the university was also set on fire. According to the laws of war under international humanitarian law, this constitutes a war crime, even if it is directed against one's own population. One must not commit war crimes against one's own population. Since the beginning of October, the Russian forces have taken the initiative. However, they have not, like the Ukrainian forces, launched a large-scale offensive. Instead, they focus on local points of attack with the goal of consolidating their previous conquests and avoiding larger losses. The current Russian focal points are in Avdivka, where they are already present in the suburbs. The complete conquest of Avdivka would pave the way for the consolidation of the eastern Donbass region. In the Kupiansk area, the Russians have amassed over 40,000 troops, apparently to conquer the Kharkiv region. It is likely that the Russians will also take Odessa. The critical situation in Ukraine has prompted the United States to develop a new strategy. The Ukrainian forces are to go into strategic defense for the time being, similar to the Russians last year. The goal is to hold the territory still under their control from well-fortified defensive positions and above all, to reduce the high personnel losses. This is intended to create the conditions for a long-term strengthening and greater endurance of the Ukrainian armed forces, as well as for the economy. They call this the four-phase strategy, fight, build, recover, and reform. They are currently trying to bring this strategy closer to President Zelensky and above all to convince him that in 10 years, the Ukrainian armed forces will have significant combat power and a high deterrent factor. By the end of this year, the combat power of the Ukrainian armed forces should be significantly greater than it is today. However, this means that the Ukrainian president would have to give up his goal of recapturing all territories occupied by Russia, including Crimea because the front is to be stabilized where it is now. This strategy, which is planned for 10 years, envisages that European allies undertake specific commitments for military and economic support. These commitments are to be defined in binding national documents and agreed upon in a bilateral agreement with Ukraine. The 10-year commitment serves as a safeguard against the termination of support for Ukraine announced by Trump. It is also intended to prevent a change of government in a European country from leading to a change of course. In einem europäischen Staat zu einem Kurswechsel der Europäer führt. Großbritannien hat übrigens bereits einen entsprechenden Vertrag. The United Kingdom has already signed a corresponding agreement with the Ukrainian government. The federal government is also ready to enter into this 10-year support and assistance commitment. If all NATO states follow this example, it could amount to NATO membership through the back door, at least in terms of collective defense under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. Therefore, there are considerations in the USA to create a mechanism with Ukraine that resembles Article 4 of the NATO Treaty. This article provides for member states to consult each other when the territorial integrity, political independence, or security of a member is threatened. In this context, the rift between Zelensky and the military commander-in-chief, General Solushny, is of particular importance, leading to Solushny's dismissal last Thursday. The issue was ultimately about the responsibility for the mobilization of 500,000 soldiers to compensate for the high personnel losses. The question was whether the military, i.e. Solushny, or the politics should take on this responsibility. Neither Solushny nor Zelensky wanted to take on this responsibility. However, fundamental disagreements about the conduct of operations, the achievability of political goals in this war, and the public presentation of military successes were decisive.
öffentliche Darstellung der militärischen Erfolge bzw. Misserfolge. Als Salushni dann Anfang November Failures. When Salushni publicly announced at the beginning of November last year that the offensive was a failure, he openly contradicted his president. The latter consistently presented the situation in an overly positive light and, of course, received more attention and confirmation from Western politicians and the media for it. Solushny's dismissal occurred in an extremely critical phase. It will soon become apparent that Zelensky's decision was a big mistake. By the way, his successor is an ethnic Russian. This shows how closely these two peoples are intertwined. After the failure of this offensive, Fear is growing in Europe. There is concern that Russia's strategic goal might be the conquest of the entire Ukraine. After that, the goal could be to attack the Baltic states or Poland and start a war with NATO. If you have read the Weltam Suntag, then you know that this was described in great detail. For some time now, the German media has been advocating the thesis that the attack on Ukraine is part of a long-term imperial strategy. The goal is to reclaim the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. Since the military situation has clearly turned in favor of Russia, so-called military experts are spreading war fear almost hysterically. Whether this is due to ignorance, ideological narrow-mindedness, or sheer self-importance, I do not know. Pura Wichtigtuerei geschieht, ich weiß es nicht. Vielleicht auch um das Bemühen für die Perhaps it's also about the effort to justify the improvement of the Bundeswehr's defense capability. This is not clearly recognizable. Obviously, especially those who predicted a military victory or war gain for Ukraine some time ago, want to mobilize further support for Ukraine without hesitation. They claim that a defeat of Ukraine would not satisfy Russia's hunger for power, and therefore, it would not shy away from an attack on NATO countries. Germany and Europe would then face a decade of confrontation by Russia. It is remarkable that politicians justify the demand for a significant increase in defense spending with the assumption of an allegedly imminent Russian war of aggression. For more than a decade, German politicians have accepted the constitutional breach that occurred in 2011 through the so-called realignment of the Bundeswehr. To make it very clear, we do not need a dangerous war history to justify that the Bundeswehr must be capable of national and federal defense. It is entirely sufficient to finally fulfill the constitutional mandate. The question remains whether there is convincing evidence that Russia will not only be capable of attacking NATO in a few years, but is also preparing for it because Russia intends to do so. Putin rejected the accusation that he had set his sights on restoring the Russian Empire, saying, nobody wants to believe us, nobody wants to believe that we are not trying to bring back the Soviet Union. He added, whoever does not miss the Soviet Union has no heart, whoever wants it back has no mind. At the last Valdai conference in October of last year, Putin stated, I only quote this to show that there are no clear statements from Russia as they are portrayed by us. He said, the crisis in Ukraine is not a conflict over territory. I want to emphasize that. Russia is the largest country in the world. We have no interest in reclaiming more territories. Only one side is always depicted. Hegel said, the whole is the truth and the half is the untruth. I haven't heard the whole story in a long time. What does it look like in practice? Is there even a prerequisite for an attack on NATO states or for the conquest of the entire Ukraine? Because that would be the prerequisite. In its attack on Ukraine in February 2022, Russia deployed about 190,000 soldiers against a Ukrainian force more than twice as large. This force had been excellently trained and equipped by the West. It must have been clear to the Russian leadership that conquering the entire Ukraine was impossible. Even if they are always portrayed as incompetent by the West, they still understand basic arithmetic. With 190,000 men, one cannot assume that Russia intended to conquer the entire Ukraine. That is simply out of the question. Moreover, a Russian occupation of this large country would require a huge effort in terms of occupation troops. 
For comparison, 300,000 Russian soldiers were stationed in the small GDR. How many would it have to be in the vast Ukraine? Another point is that Russia's ambition has always been to have a buffer between Russia and NATO. This buffer would be gone if the whole of Ukraine were occupied. This would mean that NATO soldiers and Russian soldiers would be directly facing each other. The risk that a confrontation could start due to human or technical failure, which then could not be politically controlled, would be great. And we have seen throughout the entire Ukraine war that both Russia and the United States have always tried to avoid a direct confrontation. So that was not possible at the time. In the West, this was celebrated as a major embarrassment for the Russians because they were unable to assert themselves. That's a different story. But there's something else I want to quickly mention. In the course of the Istanbul peace negotiations at the end of March 2022, Russia then, due to the positive course of the negotiations for both sides and as a sign of goodwill, withdrew its troops from the conquered areas around Kiev and contractually assured the complete withdrawal to the status before the start of the attack, namely to February 23, 2022. Therefore, I assume that the attack on Ukraine is not part of an imperial plan to reconquer the former Soviet spheres of influence, or even all of Europe, for that matter. Of course, war objectives can change over the course of a war. Whether the assumptions about Russian attack intentions are correct could be very easily determined by agreeing to a ceasefire followed by peace negotiations. Moreover, as a result of the negotiations, Arrangements could also emerge that prevent Ukrainian territory from being used by Russia as a staging area for an attack on Central Europe. Furthermore, agreements could be made with Russia that would primarily increase the security of the Baltic states. They could also contribute to greater stability between NATO and Russia overall. For example, I am thinking of an updated CFE treaty. This would include the limitation of conventional armed forces with a new flank arrangement. Equally important would be confidence-building military measures. These measures would contribute to greater transparency and predictability of political military actions. Apparently, it is particularly important to Moscow to prevent the expansion of NATO through the membership of Ukraine up to the Russian border. Russia has been pursuing the goal since the 1990s of creating a strategic buffer zone to NATO, a so-called cordon sanitaire. This idea has been revived recently in the form of a demilitarized zone on Ukrainian territory. Recently, however, Russian operational leadership also shows that Russia is taking precautions. These are intended to reduce the risk of Western troops intervening in the war to prevent a total defeat of Ukraine. In Germany, the fact that an agreement initialed by both sides was reached in Istanbul at the end of March 2022 is suppressed or denied. This is the case even though not even the Ukrainian government denies this. Ukrainian negotiators have confirmed this publicly on multiple occasions. The reasons for this are obvious. A closer look at the content of the agreement would show that Ukraine had achieved a very good result, a result that would have ended the war on quite acceptable terms for Ukraine after six weeks. Any reasonable person would then ask why Zelensky was not willing to prevent the death of half a million Ukrainians and the destruction of the country by signing it, especially after he had spoken positively about the negotiations in Russian media during the talks. And any reasonable person would also continue to ask why he and the Western states supporting him, above all, are still not willing to give peace a chance now. The politicians who prevented peace between Russia and Ukraine at the beginning of April were obviously convinced that Russia could be defeated by Ukraine with their support. That this was a fiction should have become clear to everyone by now. The Ukrainians have achieved what their armed forces were capable of with Western support. The West should therefore no longer burden itself with guilt for the tragic fate of the Ukrainian people. 
Ukraine will never be able to defeat Russia militarily, even with Western support through weapons and ammunition supplies and the training of Ukrainian soldiers. Durch die Ausbildung ukrainischer Soldaten Russland militärisch niemals besiegen. Selbst die bisher und immer wieder aufs Neue. Even the delivery of so-called game changers, sometimes tanks, sometimes something else, repeatedly demanded by lay people, are not the hoped for miracle weapons. Moreover, others have hoped for miracle weapons before. In any case, they are not capable of changing the strategic situation in favor of Ukraine. The Ukrainian armed forces are in an extremely critical condition. After the high losses, they no longer have the strength to achieve a strategic turnaround. The bitter truth is that despite massive support from the USA and Europe with modern weapons, a military defeat of Ukraine is emerging. Nevertheless, our media says that more weapons need to be delivered. But weapons cannot replace soldiers. Therefore, it looks as if Ukraine now wants to shift the war to a different level, as I have already mentioned, thus acting deep into Brussels with weapon systems. I think the window of opportunity for a negotiated peace could quickly close. If the West does not seriously strive for a negotiated peace, the fate of Ukraine will be decided on the battlefield. And when the weapons fall silent, Ukraine will no longer be what it once was. The West might even feel compelled, and this is my great fear, to prevent a devastating military defeat of Ukraine by actively intervening. This would create a real danger of a major European war breaking out on the European continent, including the risk of a limited nuclear war. Although both superpowers, Russia and the United States, have made great efforts to prevent exactly this, it remains to be hoped that it will still be possible to prevent the war from spreading across all of Europe. If not, now I am back to Alexander the Great, through the liveliness of the spirit of a leading politician, then perhaps because reason prevails. I can't think of anyone at the moment. Can you think of someone who could be said to have liveliness of spirit? I don't understand why government officials are not consulted. Yes, I am alive, but not of the spirit. So, the last point I want to make, and I really want to emphasize this to you, is the following. Historians have repeatedly asked themselves how it could happen that the European powers stumbled into the First World War, the original catastrophe of the 20th century. Hopefully, historians in the future will not have to ask how the Ukraine war could become the original catastrophe of the 21st century. Thank you for your patience. Des 21. Jahrhunderts werden konnte. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Geduld.